Wow, it was back and forth. The Dodgers, man, they got a lead. And then guys that usually don't give up leads, like Ryan Brazier, they give up some runs. A lot of times in this game, and I know this isn't going to make you feel any better, because when you lose a game to a hated rival, I'm not even going to say an arch rival, a hated rival like the San Diego Padres, you do it at home, first game of a homestand, you have the lead, it's extra innings, it's epic. Anytime something like that happens, you want to take your remote control and you want to throw it right through the TV. Hey, I'm with you. We're all in that boat, guys. But I'm telling you, if you're around this game as a fan, a player, a coach, a manager, whatever it may be, if you're around it enough, you're going to lose. And you're going to lose quite a bit, actually. And so there are times, yes, there's execution to it. And we're going to get into the execution and the X and O's of why last night happened and what happened. So, yes, there was execution that was left to be out there by the Dodgers. No doubt about that. But there's always going to be that. This is the most difficult game, in my opinion, in the world. And so execution isn't always going to be perfect. So there are times where you got to sit back and think, man, it sucks to lose to the Padres, but got to tip my hat to them, man. They did a great job. Like, they got the lead in the first inning on a Manny Machado curveball. First pitch curveball, that was in the bottom half of the plate. Now, it did split the middle in terms of being in the middle of the plate, but he ambushed a first pitch curveball. That was a good pitch, by the way, because it started above the zone and broke to the bottom. So that kind of made me think a couple of things. There's been some rumors that maybe Yoshinobu Yamamoto was tipping pitches. I think another thing is, too, you know, his two outings that have gone sideways to him in the regular season have both been against the Padres. And in the first inning, he gives up a home run. That is a curveball that, that, breaks to the bottom of the zone that gets ambushed, that makes me think, you know, kind of like in football, your first game of the season, you have that entire offseason to work on, game plan, figure out what the other team's going to do. So I wonder if maybe knowing that the Dodgers were their first opponent, that they didn't just dive in a whole lot more than they would on normal pitchers. And then not only that, it was only a two-game series, so I think they had a pretty good idea of who they were going to face as far as starting pitchers. And so maybe the the Padres had extra time to study the mix of Yoshinobu Yamamoto, how they thought he was going to attack each hitter. And because of that, maybe they knew which pitches to ambush. Because as you look at the home runs, each home run really was kind of a different setup in terms of what the Padres ambushed and were able to hit out of the yard. So give you – hey, even if Manny Machado, let's say that – even if Yoshinobu Yamamoto is tipping pitches, even if the Padres, because the Dodgers were their first opponent in 2024 and they had all offseason to study Yoshinobu Yamamoto, so they knew him like a book, they knew it was coming, even if all that is the case, which may be a little bit too tinfoil hattish, you still have to execute. And that home run that Machado hit that, that got the scoring started for them definitely was a pitch that even if you know it's coming, it's not easy to execute on. So the Padres, they take the the two to nothing lead. See, Fernando Tatis Jr., his base hit. It was on a a center cut fastball. So there's two different pitches that got ambushed by Yoshinobu Yamamoto in the same inning. One was a fastball, one was a curveball. That tells me something's going on that's allowing the Padres to know what's coming and to know what pitches to ambush from that perspective. So either they've done their homework or Yoshinobu Yamamoto is giving them something that they can pick up on. So the Padres, they score a pair in the top of the first. They get the lead, man, in these highly and hotly contested games. It's always a big deal to get the lead, although the Dodgers battled back, eventually had a 7-4 to lead. Bottom of the first inning, Shoyo Tani. Hey, Craig Osterberg. Great job on Dodgers Dogs Live oh, a couple of shows ago. He mentioned the fact he thought Shohei Otani was a little bit too pull heavy and that, you know, hey, maybe he starts he needs to start staying inside the ball, taking it the other way. Well, and, and we've talked about, hey, when you when you when you think opposite field gap and you're a gap to gap hitter like Freddie Freeman, then you can't be beat because you're letting the ball get a little bit deeper. This is a for instance for Shohei Otani. 
So this was a fastball that was on the outer quadrant. It was up in the zone. So when he's thinking left center like he has been in the last week or two, then if you throw a fastball in the outer half and it's low, he's going to hit that seed right over the shortstop's head. It's going to go to the wall and be a double to left center, right? If you throw him on the outer half in the upper quadrant, we're going to see what happened last night, and it's going to end up being a home run you know, to the opposite field. So great job, Shoei Otani. Ambush is a fastball on the outer half, up in the zone, and gets the Dodgers right back in it in the bottom of the first inning to move the score to 2-1. Two, two, so here you go. You've had a curveball that was ambushed by Manny Machado. You've had a fastball that was ambushed by Fernando Tatis Jr. And then here's another first pitch. Ha Song Kim. He jumps all over a not totally center cut. It was a little bit on the inner half, but it was center cut in terms of height. I mean, it was right down the middle in terms of height. So here's another ambush, another first pitch ambush. Ha Song Kim gets all over a fastball that's just a little bit on the inner half, but right down the middle in terms of the north and south. And he hits another home run, gives the Padres a little bit more distance at 3-2-1. Then in the bottom of the second inning, see, this is what's interesting for the Dodgers. Okay, we talked about King. How they did it. Dodgers did a great job doing their homework, having a great plan against King. Hey, some hitters were wanting to attack a little bit of a right turn to the sinker for the Dodgers. Others, like Max Muncie, he took two sinkers that were really good pitches. So a lot of times lefties, they like that down and in pitch because they have that little bit of an uppercut to their swing. Well, not necessarily Max Muncie. Max Muncie likes the ball out over the plate. He likes to pull that ball a lot of times on the outer, not completely on the outer half, but maybe a ball that's running away from him. He likes to get out over the plate and get extended on those balls. Okay, so King did a really good job of throwing a couple of sinkers that were low in the zone, one that was inside, and because Max Muncie has such great plate discipline, this is the at-bat that shows why Max Muncie is so good at hitting home runs for the Dodgers. He lays off of two really good sinkers that have good movement, that, that are down in the zone. One of them is down and in. And because of that, he gets into a really nice count. Then he also lays off of a sweeper, right, that's on the outer half. So because of that, he gets into a nice hitter's count. He ambushes a straight fastball, the four-seam fastball, that straighter, that is a little bit in basically the exact same pitch that Hassan Kim ambushed in the top of the second inning. Max Muncie, because he had done a great job of identifying sinker and sweeper, staying off of it, he got to the straight four-seam fastball, and he did not miss it. Went tattoo to move the score now to three to two. So this was a good sign. Hey, we talked about with James Altman and Gavin Lux at the bottom of the lineup. Man, I don't even care what their batting average is. Just get on base. James Altman did a good job drawing a walk. Now, albeit Gavin Lux reached on an error, but still, man, we've talked about with those two. If they can just figure out a way to get on base, turn that thing over to the murderer's row, it's going to be a good situation for the Dodgers. And it certainly was last night when James Altman got on with a walk. Gavin Lux gets on by error, reached via error. And then, hey, here's another ambush. It, it was the craziest thing. I mean, hitters were just, they were looking first pitch, whatever they were looking for. We saw Max Muncy spit on the sinker from King. This time, Mookie Betts ambushes the sinker. So it's different for each player. It's different what their keys are. I just found that was interesting, which pitches that were getting ambushed by which hitters in the Dodgers lineup. It's obvious that the analytics were good for them. They had a just tremendous game plan as far as how they wanted to attack King. And then also, I mentioned it with Manny Machado, just because you have a game plan, that doesn't mean you're always going to execute. So the Dodgers had a great game plan. Mookie Betts ambushes a sinker and brings the Dodgers back to within 5-2-3. Great job, James Outman, getting on base. Great job, Gavin Lux, getting on base. Great job, Mookie Betts, once it turned over, knowing what pitch to ambush, executing, and getting the Dodgers right back in it. And in the lead now with the three-run homer at 5-3. to three. Now you're thinking, okay, the Dodgers have the lead. They gave up the early home run to Machado. That was kind of like the balloon busted, right? But, hey, you recovered. It's 5-3. to three. You have a good bullpen. You're going to have Ryan Brazier, Daniel Hudson, 
All these guys ready tonight. You're feeling pretty good about it if you're a Dodgers fan at this point. So we've talked about, you know, the the Max Muncy deal where he was sitting on a four seam. Mookie Betts was sitting on a two seam. Well, how about this? Freddie Freeman and his single, the Dodgers are getting ready to add on two more here later in the game in the bottom of the third inning. Freddie Freeman didn't swing at the, the sinker, didn't swing at the four seam, either one of them. He got a sweeper, and and both of those pitches, both the sinker and the four seam, he got to start his at bat. Both were strikes, and one of them was was almost center cut in the middle of the the zone in terms of being east and west. It was almost right in the middle of the zone of that. Now it was on the bottom part of the zone, but Freddie Freeman can hit the bottom of the zone very very well. But he didn't swing at either one of those. He got that sweeper pitch that comes into his barrel, and then he just banged one for a single, got on base, and then that's when Tio Hernandez gave the Dodgers a four-run lead with another home run, another first-pitch ambush. This one is the sinker. This is the theme last night. This this theme of first-pitch ambushing just tells me that both of these teams had all offseason to study each other, every single pitcher, on roster and because of that they had very 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 specific game plans the atmosphere was electric and and like i said they have because just because you have a game plan doesn't mean you're going to execute but i think because the environment was so charged you're talking about elite baseball players like a manny machado like a fernando tatis jr has elite talent and then all the dodgers roster guys were executing too so Tio Hernandez, he jumps all over a first pitch sinker, hits a home run after the Freddie Freeman uh, base hit on the sweeper where he didn't swing at either fastball. So the Dodgers now have a 7-4 to four lead, and it's a 7-3 to three lead, excuse me. And right now you're thinking, man, th- this is a good setup. So the Padres go dry for a couple innings, and then in the bottom of the fifth, Shohei Otani, Leads off with a double, and he's able to hit a slider this time. So, man, how do you get Shohei Otani out? I mean, this you saw that the Padres attack him to the to the outside on the top part of the zone, uh, the on the home run. Well, then they now this one they every pitch that they threw to him was in the bottom of the zone. They threw him sweepers, changeups. So in this at bat, Shohei Otani had seen three different pitches. He had seen two sweepers. He had seen a changeup, and then he hit for a base hit, the first slider that he saw. I mean, I I can't tell you how difficult that is to see. Out of four pitches, you see three different pitch styles and pitch types. And the first time you see uh, a in particular pitch, you bang it for a base hit. That is a guy that's just otherworldly. That is just, you know, hey, game plan's whatever. That's not game plan. That's just Shohei Otani being a generational type hitter and banging a double off of the the left off of the left field wall and into left field and just doing a great job there. So hey, Shohei Otani has been very very good. And then that brings us to the top of the sixth inning when Jake Cronenworth goes yard off of Daniel Hudson. And again, this was a, a good battle here. This goes back to what we talked about with Daniel Hudson oh a couple of days ago. Okay, the sequencing is elite. The execution hasn't been as elite as the sequencing. He's getting there, but again, he pulled a couple of pitches. And the one pitch that he's been pulling, you know, to that back foot of left-handers has been that slider. Again, he pulled a four-seam fastball low. He was trying to work the bottom of the zone to Cronenworth, and he was trying to get to that slider, that back foot, and he got to it. He pulled that slider to the back foot, which meant that he had to bring it back into the zone, reduce a little bit of the movement, and when he did that, so Cronenworth got to see two sliders in the row, and the second slider that he saw was smaller than the first one because Hudson was just trying to throw it for a strike, and because of that, he'd already seen the spin, and he saw the spin the pitch before. He was able to jump all over it and nail one, over the right center field wall and bring the Padres back to within seven to four. But to be honest with you, you're thinking, hey, it's all good. We've got a good bullpen set up, still up 
you know, three runs at this point, and the Padres, that was all they got in that inning. So moving to the bottom of the sixth inning, I'm thinking, okay, three more bats for San Diego. Even, you know, having a three-run lead, even if they come back and score enough runs to tie, surely the Dodgers aren't done offensively, and we definitely saw that. Of course, the Dodgers. Here's the thing, too, though. You get a 7-4 to lead, and 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th. So seven innings in a row, your offense goes dry. That's exactly how you have comebacks. The first thing you have to do to execute a comeback is that you have to, on defense, stop the other team first. So if you're down four or five runs, or five runs or whatever, and you say put up a two spot, cut the lead in half, even if the other team comes back and scores one, it just feels like you're still just fighting uphill. The fact that the Dodgers went eight innings in a row when they had that lead, that's what cost them the game. If they would have just scored one run in that time, they win the game. It's that simple. So, yes, Brazier gave up some runs. Yes, Daniel Hudson gave up a home run. Yes, none of that's good. None of that's fun. But really, in my opinion, the game was lost because the offense went dry again. It was more of what we saw last year where it was boomer bust. You're either hitting home runs or you're not scoring at all. And because of that, then the Padres, it gave the Padres eight innings. Actually, it gave them six innings in regulation to figure out how to score enough runs to get back in the game. When you got guys like Manny Machado, Hassan Kim, Jake Cronenworth, Fernando Tatis Jr., if you allow them, if you stop scoring and give them the time to come back, they're capable of doing it, as we saw last night with the Padres as they hung that seven, that three spot in the seventh, and it goes extra innings. And then in the 11th inning, the Padres score one run in the top of the inning on a Jackson Merrill. Great, nice young player. I, I, not a Padres fan, obviously, but you got to respect the fact that Jackson Merrill is a very, very, very good player. Offensive player, young player for the Padres. Give him credit. He hit a fastball off of Alex Vesia, who has had back-to-back performances that I'm sure Dodgers fans aren't super pleased with. But, hey, it is what it is. Alex Vesia, towards the end of last year, basically from July on, was really good. He was really good in spring training. And he is in the Dodgers' trust tree at least to an extent. So that's one of those deals that's really a lightning bolt for Dodgers fans. But give credit to Jackson Merrill. Hey, and here's the thing, though. You got a young player. He saw four four four-seam fastballs in a row. He saw the same pitch, four pitches in a row. And, boy, you and basically they were all to the same part of the zone. Now, a couple of of them were more to the middle in terms of, of east and west, you know, splitting the plate. But they were all to the top of the zone. And the one that Merrill hit actually was the one that got out over the plate. And so it kind of did him a favor in the sense that you threw the same pitch, the four-seam fastball, four times in a row, and then he just sat and waited for the one that he could actually hit, did a good job getting one out over the plate and getting the single and doing a good job of putting the Padres in the lead. And in the bottom of the 11th inning, Chris Taylor pops up, Miguel Rojas grounds out, and then Mookie Betts flies out to end the game, and it was tough. That was a tough loss, not going to lie. Of course, it's 162. Said it earlier in the show, one of the great things about baseball is that you get to play every single day. So you get to show up the next day, and you get to put the uniform back on, that beautiful Dodgers across the front, and you get to try to go kick your arch rivals ass, the Padres, in front of what's going to be a large electric crowd on Saturday evening. So, hey, that is my breakdown of the Dodgers and Padres game for last night. Hope you enjoyed it. It's time now to take a trip down on the farm. So I want to start with the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes, and I wanted to start with this young man, big old tall drink of water out of Middle Tennessee State. That would be Eric Swan. He goes up a ways, as you can see here. The Dodgers love those tall right-handers that can throw the ball through the roof. Patrick Copen is another guy that we have talked about a lot. We saw him in the spring breakout game. Big old tall guy with a big fastball. 
Jared Kiros doesn't have like the 100 mile hour fastball, but he is very tall. Kendall Williams, those kind of guys, the Dodgers love these tall guys, especially younger like Eric Swan that can throw the ball through the roof. Okay, open your eyes wide open for this young man. Now, the deal is with him and Copeland, it's all about upside. The Dodgers drafted them in 2023 because they saw what they could become. And again, well, you know, I've I've talked to a couple of scouts, Tom Kunis, who's on the amateur side, just got through talking to Jack Murphy on the pro side, scouting-wise for the Dodgers. They both mentioned it's not what the player is, it's what they can become. So you go and watch a guy like Eric Swan at Middle Tennessee State. It's Tuesday afternoon, and it's 38 degrees, and you're looking at this guy that, has all this potential. He's tall, he's big, he gets downhill, and he can just throw the ball through the roof. You're not worried about, hey, what's the command look like at this time? It's like when he's in the zone, how badly does he beat hitters? Because we can get him in the lab with the Dodgers. We can add weight. We can show him a new grip. We can show him a whole new – let's go ahead and watch that again. We can show him a whole new set of ways of doing things and training. He's going to be doing it more often because he's a pro – And then Eric Swan, we can get that guy in here, and three or four years from now, we can get him in the strike zone, and we know that when he's in the strike zone, he's going to be a major league pitcher. Try this on for size. 96, what you're seeing here on this picture here, 96 to 98. Slider was 86 to 90, that slider there. And the changeup was 88 to 91. Wow, that's incredible. And also, talk to Sean Coyne about this outing for him. He also has a curveball that I think they're going to use for him just to kind of flip it in there to, you know, change speeds. I mean, a lot of this is hard to harder. We're talking about 90-plus on every single pitch. So he's going to need a slower pitch to change a little bit more speeds. This guy is going to be at least 100 miles an hour. The Dodgers have him and Copen in the lab. They're starting to throw more strikes. And when he can throw that slider, that's 90 to 91 with a fastball that's going to be 100 miles an hour with that type of length and extension with a curveball that he can flip over for a strike, say maybe at 80, 81 miles an hour. Again, it's in the developmental stage. But Eric Swan, keep checking in on him. So another pitcher that's with Rancho, starting with Rancho, I want to show you here is Gabe Emmett. And what I wanted to show you here is just kind of his uniqueness as you go through his windup. You know, we talk about these high-riding tall guys like Patrick Copen, like Eric Swan. See how he's a little bit of a side slot here? So I don't have my Telestrator working today. I can't quite figure it out on this video. But so I'm going to use my mouse. So that means this ball is going to cut. He's more of an east and west a right to left type of pitcher watch the cut on that ball there see that that's not even his slider that's just his fastball that cut so gabe emmett and there's a slider there he can add depth to that so i really like gabe emmett he spent i think now the parts of three different years at rancho i do think the significance to him gabe emmett if you're a great lakes fan of course he's in the single a level which is the lowest affiliate of, of the now they do have the complex below Rancho, but Rancho is the lowest affiliate in their system. But I think Gabe Emmett will be the very first promotion. I don't think he's going to be in Rancho very long. I could see him easily getting promoted here in the next couple of weeks. So here is more of Patrick Copen as you see him on your screen. This dude, man, this dude is really, really talented. I am really excited about Copen, the young man out of Marshall University. That again, we mentioned it with Eric Swan. Very similar type setups for both of them. Both guys that the Dodgers took based on what they saw they could become. And this is a guy that is has a lot to offer, man. I mean, he gained, you can see him right here, he gained about 15 pounds in the offseason. Most of it is in his legs that you can see, the trunks that he has in the lower part of his body. Add a lot of good muscle weight to that. 94 to 97, so two young fireballers at Rancho Cucamonga, Eric Swan, Patrick Copen. He throws a four seam and a two seam, so he's going to offer both a right turn and a fastball that can straighten out like you saw right there on that pitch. And then also he throws a cutter, which is going to allow him to throw that cutter right there. Going to allow him to throw a lot more strikes. That's been the thing about him. Like all these young pitchers, just working on command. Use Look at that cutter right there. Use the minor league system to get all of your 
deficiencies, if you will, all figured out by the time. So hopefully when you get to Los Angeles, look at that sweeping slider. He also has that. And then he also flips in a curveball just to get ahead of hitters and to keep them off balance in terms of speed. So again, a four seam, two seam cutter, slider, curveball for the 2023 draft pick out of Marshall, Patrick Copen. This is Jake Geloff, and look at this. One, two, three, three, two, one, launch. Wow. Jake Geloff, huge power. This was his first home run of the year. What I want you to notice is he's a great hitter first. See how he stays inside this ball. Look how he's inside that ball right there. See how the hands stay way inside. The barrel is lagging. That is a guy that is thinking up the middle to oppo, and then whenever you get the pitch elevated like it is here, that's when he can get it in the air. So this is a guy kind of similar to Max Muncy. He reminds me of a right-handed version of Max Muncy. This is a guy that if he wants to hit 300 and just hit gap-to-gap -gap line drives, I think he can do that. But like Max Muncy, I think the organization is going to task him to hit some home runs. And so he is going to do this right here. Get some lift on the ball and get the ball in the air and hit home runs. Hey, talk about all the time. You never can tell, you know, that a player has to make a million adjustments as they go through the minor league system. So there, it's always too early to tell in single A, which, again, is the lowest affiliate with the Dodgers. But if there ever was a guy that you would say, hey, that's going to be a major leaguer, it would be Jake Geloff. He already has a brother that is in the major leagues, super big power, stays inside the ball, great hitter first, can get the ball in the air and hit absolute tanks. Moving on up the system, of course, we mentioned Rancho is at the bottom of the affiliates. Then if you go from Rancho, which is single A, up to high A, which is Great Lakes. That's the Midwest League, which is that Ohio, Michigan, Indiana area. And so this is Jake Vogel. Jake Vogel is a young man that was drafted out of high school. Very talented. One of the fastest young players in the system. The offense just simply hasn't clicked yet at the professional level. But that doesn't mean the offensive skills aren't there. And kind of like a Jordan Kendall guy that we saw uh, many different times out of Vanderbilt, when you have the type of skills that Jake Vogel has – and you can hit home runs like that, and you can run, you're going to get opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to figure it out because the Dodgers, I mean, they need guys like this that can run, that can be dynamic, that can steal bases. Jake Vogel can do all that. Again, using the minor league system to get the offensive side of the ball figured out. But when it goes right, he is very, very good. So hopefully Jake Vogel repeating at the high A level again this year. Hopefully he can get the offense figured out, get it consistent, and start reaching that offensive potential because we know the speed is there, the defense is there, and all of that. So great potential for Jake Vogel. So Austin Brubaker has mentioned a couple of times that the Dodgers picked up Noah Miller last in the offseason. And, man, what a big pickup. Of course, the Dodgers need depth at the shortstop position. They have a million young shortstops. Alex Freeland actually has moved to third base a lot with Noah Miller. So it's been Alex Freeland at third, Noah Miller at shortstop. And I wanted to give you a front side look of the very, very short compact swing. Look at this right here. Set up. See that stretch? The, this is called stretch here. That knob points to the catcher. That's one of the very first techniques. Weight is on the back. And so then you can move the weight forward through the baseball and look how soft he He's one of those that lands with the some, – some hitters land flat-footed. Most hitters actually land to the front of their foot, and then they rotate around the ball or foot there. As you can see, how he lands a little bit flatter than a lot of guys. From here, this is where the shift goes. Now, I want you to watch just how direct his path is through the ball. This See how direct that is? I mean, my gosh, it doesn't get much more direct than that. That is a short swing. That's going to see that right there, that zero-degree slot because the barrel is exactly level. That's a very short swing. That's going to get him directly to the ball. See how deep he's let, uh, letting that ball get. Usually hitters like to hit that ball four to six inches out in front. But because he's so, so short and he's just thinking contact, he's able to stay short and compact and get a base hit. So I love that compact setup of Noah Miller, exciting young player in the system. Hey, here's another guy that I wanted to highlight because I think he's a guy that you need to, to put your eyes on. Jermaine Rosario, it's always been about control. Hey, he's, in the past, it's been like he'd have one inning where he looked like Nolan Ryan. Then he'd come out the next inning and he just couldn't find the strike zone. So he has used the last couple of years in the system. Nice little slider there from Rosario 
to refine the strike zone, get in the strike zone, refine his command. Still at the high, that's why he's still at the high level. This guy has stuff that could get outs at the major league level right now, but he's still at the high level with Great Lakes because he is trying to refine his command. So, hey, Dave Anderson, nobody better to work with. This is going to be a great setup for him, great staff to work with. So, Keep your eyes on Jermaine Rosario because – see that pitch right there? I mean, that's a really, really nice little slider curveball pitch, if you will. There's another one right there. So you see the good stuff for him. Keep your eyes on him. I'll cover him throughout the summer. We will see if he can get that command to the point to where he can move up to double A and then triple A and get hitters out. We talk about all the time. The biggest adjustment is, hey, as you move up, hitters stop swinging at pitches that aren't on the plate. So that's the the hurdle that Rosario will have to jump. We'll see if he can do it. Keep checking in. And here's another guy that's really, really under the radar. UL Monroe, originally from Canada, Lucas Webb. Now, what I want you to notice here from him, look at that herky-jerky windup. I mean, that's uncomfortable. That's a situation to where the hitter is not going to get a comfortable look on Webb. And then also, he's a dropper. So he drops the ball in separation. So he drops the ball all the way down here. That's going to give him more time to get a longer stride. And it's also here going to hide the baseball better. So the hitter does not, still doesn't see it. See the, right here, the ball's behind his head. The, still, the hitter right now still, you can tell right here by the look on his face, he's trying to find the baseball and he can't because it's hidden until it comes right out of his hand. And then they, right there, the late reaction. That's why you get the late reaction because you get the herky-jerky windup. You get the really hidden ball. And because of that, hitters don't see it and they are late. So Lucas Webb wanted to cover him just for a second. This time of year, the Tulsa Driller is at the double-A level. So we've talked about Rancho, which is the bottom affiliate. We moved up to the high-A Great Lakes Loons, which is the next step up. Now let's go up another step to double-A Tulsa, just two steps away from the major leagues. Double-A Tulsa is always the funnest team in the minor leagues to cover for the first, like, until about July. Because, like, last year they had all this firepower, maybe the best pitching staff in the history of minor league baseball with all of these guys like Emmett Sheehan and in the past they've had Bobby Miller and all those guys I mean just incredible stuff Kyle Hurt all those guys were with double-a Tulsa and so the double-a Tulsa always starts with just the best prospects in the system they have Dalton Rushing Diego Cartaya Yainer Fernandez all these guys on this roster hey this is Noah Miller here and this is a guy there is a reason why he was such a high draft pick. And that is because he is very good. You saw right here what I want you to show you, just the simplicity of a setup. Watch how nothing moves. Watch his head right here. Watch how quiet this swing is. See how quiet that is? Just put the pick the foot up, put it back down the head still. Watch that head. Never moves. No wasted contact. Just, I mean, really simple setup, but yet with a lot of power. So I wanted to show you, this home run right here by Austin Beck. And just to show you how much power he has with a simple setup, remind Dodgers fans how big of a prospect he was coming out of the draft. There's a reason why he was drafted so high. Of course, that was a little bit misleading. Austin Beck obviously was not drafted last summer. He was drafted in 2017, but a very high draft pick. What would that be now? Seven years ago. Hey, this is T.Y. Taylor Young, the all-time hits leader in Louisiana Tech. And, man, you talk about compact. Just a gritty little gamer type guy. Love this guy. Look how simple that comp that, that setup is. And what he did, see this, this north and south? He has actually made some adjustments so he can do more damage. See how that ball is getting in the air? That's actually a low pitch that he's able to get in the air because he's made some adjustments to try to make – uh, to make more to do more damage he knew he we always know that Taylor Young is going to gather a whole bunch of hits it's always what he's done that right there is the difference he's now able to get the ball in the air and now hit home runs his first hit of the year was a home run you saw that home run there you saw him lift the ball in the air on that first at bat so keep your eye on Taylor Young a really 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 good hitter a guy that can play anywhere along the infield huge baseball IQ Dalton rushing that back-to-back gains with home runs. This is a guy probably, hey, with Will Smith has a 10-year contract extension, probably going to have to play a different position. He played a lot of first base at Louisville. I think Will Smith, either him or 
or probably Dalton Rushing either could probably play third base if they got ground balls every day and and got to dedicate towards it because when you can hit tanks and nukes like this to dead center and the ball the ball carries like that that just goes to show you how strong he is and how hard he hits the ball when you can hit balls like that the, first of all I don't think the Dodgers would even consider trading him if he continues to uh, incline offensively and so I think they would more be more likely to figure out how to get him and Will Smith in the lineup at the same time. So look at the carry on that ball, Dalton rushing. Right-handed batter. Justin Robleski, hey, man, I've told you guys for a long time, and I don't mean that from like an arrogant perspective. I say that from a confident perspective because I've been seeing him for a long time, that Justin Robleski is the most skilled left-handed starter in the Dodgers system, minor league system. Six pitches. His command is amazing. And as a matter of fact, the Dodgers are so confident in what they do. And Duran Olinger, Ryan Dennett, great pitching coaches. They actually allow him to put a lot of his game plan together and put all of his sequencing together for him. He is that meticulously detailed, Justin Robleski is, to where he will sit around and figure out the right pitch sequences uh, sequences that he can execute and basically, from that perspective, put his own game plan together. Go out and execute it. This is a guy that's 97 to 98. He is absolutely big time. Justin Robleski, as long as he stays healthy, will be not just in the major leagues. He will be an upper echelon major league type left-handed pitcher. He is that good. One to cover Jack Little. You probably don't know who he is because he has been out due to Tommy John surgery for the last year or so. Ramped back up at the about July last year. And got to pitch a little bit from there. So this is a guy out of Stanford. You see that high riding four seam. Good carry at the top of the zone. Wanted to just kind of throw that name out there so you can remember the name Jack Little. You know, we've talked about Jack Dreyer a lot, the Maytag. But this is Jack Little. Again, nice little cutter pitch. A good four seam at the top of the zone. So put his name in your Rolodex. Remember that name. So as we go through the summer and we cover these guys, you remember Jack Little is finally back off of the Tommy John. One of my favorites, Ryan Sublette, a slide slaughter. The uniqueness to him. And I, as long as he stays healthy, I, he's going to be a major leaguer. See how he's a side slaughter here? But there's what I want you to note. He's going to be a side slot, but he stays behind the baseball, which allows him to throw that change up that is able to have some sync to it. Of course, that was his fastball there. So a slide slaughter, a side slaughter, which gives an uncomfortable look to a right-hander that can sink the baseball with a changeup. Good velo, extremely competitive. He has his emotions under control at all times. So Ryan Sublette, an under-the-radar guy, kind of like a Jordan Leisure. Now, he doesn't throw the ball 100 miles an hour like Jordan Leisure does, who, by the way, is with the Major League White Sox. Congratulations, Jordan. But from a similar under-the-radar type aspect of it, Ryan Sublette's a guy you probably haven't heard of. There's that four seam up in the zone. A guy that you need to pay attention to because as he moves up, I'm telling you he will be in the major leagues for somebody. Hopefully it's for the Dodgers because he is really good. And the thing about it, not only is he really good, he's unique. And so a lot of times it's the separators. That's a difference for guys. Good four seam up. And I think Ryan Sublet has enough separators like Jordan Leisure did with the extension, the fastball that gets down the hill that's approaching 100. So put Ryan Sublet in your Rolodex as well and keep him in mind as we move through the summer. So we started with Rancho. This is Andy Pajes, which is the lowest affiliate. We moved our way to high A, which is the Great Lakes Loons. Then we moved the double A team the Tulsa Drillers. Now here is the one step below the major leagues, AAA Oklahoma City Dodgers. How about Andy Pajes? Of course, he hit that ball off the right center field wall. But the thing about Pajes, of course, he lost all the weight, is that he hits fly balls and he pulls the ball. And he does all that with historically having strikeout rates that are below 25%. And he has the absolute bazooka for right arm. And he's lost the weight. So now I see he does that right there a lot. He pulls the ball. And then a lot of times, he, no matter of fact, in the past, he's hit twice as many fly balls as he has ground balls. So when you pull the ball like that, you get out over the plate, and then you hit the ball in the air like that, you're going to hit a lot of home runs. And when you can do it with a 23%, 24% strikeout rate, which is about where he's been in his minor league career, 
that is a major league player, especially when you add in, like I said earlier, the bazooka of an arm, just the the aura of confidence, the swag he carries himself with, the versatility in the outfield. Nothing not to like from Andy Paez. Racking up at bats at the AAA level and getting all that experience that he needs. I do think he will ETA this year, and I know Dodgers fans are uh, super excited about that. So we covered Trey Sweeney a lot in the offseason. Love that flat swing. Love that the plane of his barrel. Just love the way that he hits. I'm going to cover this again. Watch how flat this swing is. Watch how long this barrel is in the hitting zone. See, he hasn't even started the hands forward yet. See, that knob is going to come right to the baseball right there. See how that knob is pointed almost perfectly right at that ball. Now, guys feel that bottom hand to do that. I never could actually pull the bottom hand to throw that knob to the ball like that. I was a pusher with the top hand, but see how that knob is pointed exactly to the baseball. He probably doesn't even know that he does it, but he's pulling that knob with the bottom hand right directly to the baseball. This is perfect timing right here. Whenever you're able to point it up and direct it up exactly perfect like that. And because of that, look at that point of contact. Ladies and gentlemen, it does not get any sweeter than that right there. Sweeter from Trey Sweeney. Hey, another veteran. The Dodgers love these veterans that have major league experience that are on minor league contracts. This is Jesse Hahn. Keep your eyes on him because he and guys like Drew Pomeranz, they are the exact kind of guys that the Dodgers love to pick up because they are guys that have major league experience, again, that are on minor league contracts. And so I wanted to show you here the the uh, performance here of Jesse Hahn. Good fastball in the, you know, he doesn't throw it 100 miles an hour, but again, good placement. He's going to be about 93 miles an hour right there. And so a good mix for him. So as we go on throughout the summer, if he becomes a legitimate player, we'll cover him a little bit more. But keep uh, Jesse Hahn in mind. So this Stretch. is Miguel Vargas, of course. And what I wanted to show you pitch. here, the significance of this. Hey, when Miguel Vargas is going good, he takes inside pitches and inside outs them to right center. Then he takes that outside pitch, he gets out over the plate and pulls them. He's exactly opposite, which makes him such a unique matchup for a pitcher because you can't beat him on the outer half or the inner half when he is going good. So I've highlighted a couple times where he's taken an inside pitch and nailed him into right center earlier, a week or so ago. Now I'm highlighting a pitch that he got out over the plate and pulled to left field. All signs are, are headed north and pointing north for Miguel Vargas, not just from the production perspective, from the process perspective, in terms of the types of things that he is starting to do uh, as far as uh, what relates to success for him. So good to see Miguel Vargas get back to being the type of hitter he always has been. So back to the AAA Oklahoma City Baseball Club, if you will. I know I bounced around a little bit, but my videos were a little bit out of order. I apologize for that. So the last two have been Dalton Rushing, Justin Robleski, which is at the AA level. This is Eduardo Salazar. This is a guy that's sneaky. Hey, good two-seam, good slider. He's had really good outings. He's about 93, 94. The thing about him is, look at that location. Location and then movement. You saw it on two back-to-back -back pitches. You saw him located to the outer half and then move that ball in on the righty with that sinker turning right. Look at that movement there. So Eduardo Salazar, he's a guy the Dodgers just picked up as that carry to the top of the zone, has had two good outings, so we'll cover him more. Again, another guy, like we've talked about a couple already in this show, just put him in Rolodex. Remember the name Eduardo Salazar. He's with AAA Oklahoma City, so he's threatening the major leagues. Put him in your Rolodex. Remember the name so you can get it back out the next time we talk about him as the season moves on. So we had the high below with Cody Hosey yesterday. Boy, that was – I just thoroughly enjoyed watching people watch that. That got some good views, and I was so happy about that because this is a minor league grind guy in Cody Hosey that I was just so glad people were interested in still hearing about him because he has just grinded and grinded and grinded, got himself right on the – the doorsteps of the major leagues and hey we talk about all the time it's about having opportunity then seizing your opportunity playing his best baseball he ever has at the closest level to the major leagues 
So congratulations, Cody Hosey. Let's all hope that he stays healthy. Let's all hope that he continues to play as well as he is right now. And let's hope that he gets opportunity someday because he's deserved it with the grind. Hey, it hasn't been easy for him. The offensive game combined with the injuries, it's been a struggle. It's been a grind. He has shown just mental toughness and just fought through it and kept grinding. So proud of Cody Hosey. Hope he gets opportunity. Then I hope when he does get that opportunity, he takes advantage of it. All right, guys, this is legit, man. The Bill Chris Matt was simply fantastic. Matter of fact, he's been fantastic with AAA Oklahoma City. This is what you call a professional pitcher. Look at that gigantic curveball. Okay, four innings pitched, two hits, one run, five Ks, no strikeouts. That curveball you just saw, 64 inches. And look at that. That change up with that right turn to it. 64 inches of vertical drop. That nice little cutter you saw there. So not only was the curveball huge, 64 inches, that one there. He also landed it. It's one thing to throw. We talk about that all the time. It's one thing to have all these pitches that move and have all these metrics. No good if they don't land in the zone, right? Nabil Chris Matt landed that 64-inch drop to his curveball 63% of the time. When you're able to generate that kind of movement with also a right turn to your sinker and a little bit of a cutter, that pitch right there, that's called professional pitching. That is a professional pitcher, ladies and gentlemen. That is a guy the Dodgers need to get back up on the Major League roster. This guy needs to be a factor with the Dodgers because he is just so skilled in that curveball. Again, you look for separators. What's the separator for Nabil Chrismat? That curveball there is the separator. So different but the same, Nelson Lamette, effectively wild. We're seeing it here. And, hey, a lot of times I put highlights out, but for guys that are in AAA that are threatening the major leagues, I like to do the service for fans to show their entirety of their outing so they can kind of see how close maybe and make your own mind up for yourself. How close are they? Can they help the major league club? That's the service I like to give fans. Let them make up their own mind. So I, I didn't just put the good parts. I put all of the parts in here for Nelson Lamette, so you can make up your mind for yourself. What I call it is effectively wild. If you're the hitter right now and he's coming inside, he's coming outside, don't dig in because you don't know where the heck the next pitch is coming. Nelson Lamette was very, very good. So different but the same from Nabil Chris Matt in the sense that I think he is a guy that could help the Major League Club. It's not as professional in terms of command and staying in the strike zone as Chris Matt is. Matter of fact, he had two walks last night, so he minimized the wildness and used it to his advantage on pitches like that to, to have five strikeouts in 2.2 innings. His four seam had spin. Check this out. Here's why the Dodgers are going to love this guy. His spin on his four seam got all the way up to 25-31. And actually, it, 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 yeah, it hit 25-31. The slider had spin at 27-84. Let's watch that again. So to give you reference, anything above 2,300 is considered really, really good. When you get around the 2,600 range, that's elite. And Denelson Lamette was at 2,531. So he is borderline elite with his spin rate on his fastball. That was 94-96. So good velo and tremendous carry to go with that good little slider there and his change up effectively wild. So one last guy I want to cover here, and that is Drew Pomeranz. Again, Drew Pomeranz is a guy, hey, I'm telling you, the Dodgers, if you know it, I know it, we know it. We've talked about the frustrations with Alex Vesia. Despite the fact that his numbers haven't been all that bad, the Dodgers, we saw Justin Wilson, Matt Gage, those kind of guys. Of course, Justin Wilson didn't feel like he had enough opportunity to make it worth his time to stick with the Dodgers. This is Drew Pomeranz. The Dodgers are going to continue to find veteran-type guys to see if they can get him in the lab and fix them and make them factors on the Major League Club. So Drew Pomeranz was good last night, and he was good uh, with Oklahoma City, the Oklahoma City Dodgers. He is a guy that the Dodgers will give a long look to, that sweeping slider. One inning, his velo was about 92-93, also through a knuckle curve. So keep your eyes on Drew Pomeranz. Actually, lied. we're going to cover one more guy, and this is Walker Buehler. Ouch, it went off of his hand. He actually pitched through that, finished his inning. He was supposed to throw about 75 pitches, but because of that, now he did finish this inning. He ended, I think it was on 27 pitches. After this inning was over, he did not come back out. So squarely, 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 I want to make this very clear. 
He came out of the game because that ball hit his hand. Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to be permanent. You can see all the, the infielders like, oh, my God, they wanted to throw up. It was just sickening to watch that happen to a major leaguer like Walker Buehler. That catcher right there is Jesus Galise. So he did come out of the game because of his hand. That doesn't automatically mean, though, that his hand's broken or that it's gonna, he's going to miss his next start or any of that. But it does mean he, he left last night because his hand got hit. So, hey, let's hope for the best for Walker Bueller. Let's keep in touch with that situation. We will keep you informed here at Dodgers Daily. So I hope you enjoyed today's show. I know there was a lot of guys to get to. Hey, it's the early part of the season, so there's a lot of names. Just put this video on your bookmark. If it's hard to remember a lot of them, that's okay. You can always come back and maybe bookmark a player and, and maybe what what uh, what time of the video that, that they were shown here so you can go back and, and check that out later. And also, I'll be reminding you of these same guys. As we go on, as you start remembering the names, you'll start getting comfortable with hearing these names over and over and over. And then from that perspective, we can – we can really have a good time covering these guys in the minor leagues. So, hey, I hope you enjoyed today's show. Hope you tune in Sunday evening. Hope to be joined by Coach Holt or Monday morning, whichever one it's going to be whenever we release that video. Might go live Sunday evening. Just have your notifications on in case we do that. If not, we'll have a show for you Monday morning and cover all the great action from this weekend. So, until next time, hey, just a reminder to hit that like button, leave a comment, tell all your friends about Dodgers Daily, and also turn on your notifications. And if you're not – Become a subscriber. Till next time, thanks for tuning in and go Dodgers.